Pippin Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hello students, today I will be taking up the second poem in your text which is titled An Elementary School Classroom in a Slum and the poet is Stephen Spender. Stephen Spender was born in England in 1909. He is a British poet who was also known for his socialist and pacifist views. Now a pacifist is someone who loves peace and who is against wars. His collection of poems, uh, some of them uh, are poems of dedication, the edge of being, the creative element, the struggle of the modern. He has also written an autobiography titled World Within World. Stephen Spender mainly deals with the themes of social injustice and class inequalities in his writings. Stephen Spender is the recipient of the Golden Pen Award which was given to him in the year 1995. It's an award which is given for a lifetime's distinguished service to literature. Now in this particular poem, Stephen Spender speaks of social injustice and class inequalities. What does he mean by that? In, in our society, we find that all the people do not have equal opportunities. There are some sections of people who are marginalized and who are deprived of opportunities in life. Stephen Spender chooses to speak of such people and in this poem, particularly the children who live in a slum and who, who do not have access to higher education and other opportunities in life like children from affluent families. He also speaks of the social responsibility that is uh, our responsibility towards the marginalized section of the society. So let me begin by reading the poem. Far, far from gusty waves, these children's faces like rootless weeds, the hair torn round their pallor, the tall girl with a weighed down head, the paper seeming boy with rat's eyes, the stunted unlucky air of twisted bones, reciting a father's null disease, his lesson from his desk. At the back of the dim class, one unnoted, sweet and young, his eyes live in a dream of squirrel's game in a tree room other than this. On sour cream walls, donations, Shakespeare's head, cloudless at dawn, civilized dome riding all cities, belled flowery Tyrolis valley, open-handed map awarding the world its world. And yet, for these children, these windows, not this map, their world, where all their futures painted with a fog, a narrow street sealed in with a lead sky, far, far from rivers, capes, and stars of words. Surely, Shakespeare is wicked. The map, a bad example, with ships and sun and love tempting them to steal for lives that slyly turn in their cramped holes from fog to endless night. On their slag heap, these children wear skins peeped through by bones and spectacles of steel with mended glass like bottle bits on stones. All of their time and space are foggy slum. So blot their maps with slums as big as doom. Unless governor, inspector, visitor, this map becomes their window and these windows that shut upon their lives like catacombs. Break, oh break open till they break the town and show the children to the green fields and make their world run azure on gold sands and let their tongues run naked into books. The white and green leaves open, 
history theirs whose language is the sun okay finished with the reading of the poem now every word in this poem is resonant with meaning and i have used many images so that you can connect with the words and the lines that are given in the poem i'll be taking up the poem line by line and taking up uh, the words too so let us begin with the stanza 1 the in the first stanza the poet is describing the children who are sitting in a classroom inside a slum so how are these children depicted by the poet far far from gusty waves these children's faces now the children's faces the children's faces are far far from gusty waves now what do you mean by gusty waves gusty waves are waves which come and dash against the shore which are full of life and full of energy so does it mean to say that these children's faces are like gusty waves no far far in fact it's a contrast the children's faces do not resemble gusty waves in fact the children's faces show that they lack enthusiasm they lack liveliness and they lack energy so far far from gusty waves these children's faces then we have the children compared to rootless weeds like rootless weeds why are children compared to rootless weeds what are weeds first and foremost weeds are unwanted plants that grow in the garden we don't tend to the weeds we don't love the weeds we don't want the weeds similarly the children in the slum they are unwanted they are unloved and they are also uncared for so the children are compared to weeds something unwanted whom nobody loves and they are also not taken care of just like the weeds the hair torn round their pallor if you see the children of the slums they will be untidy their hair will be unkempt what do you mean by hair torn round their pallor now pallor means a pale face so the children's faces are pale which show that the children are sick the children are not healthy and we find that their hair is scattered round their face this is also similar to the point they are uncared for their hair is uncombed and it is untidily scattered round their faces so the children sitting in the classroom in the slum lack enthusiasm and energy they are compared to rootless weeds they are uncared for unwanted and unloved like the weeds and they have an untidy appearance with their uncombed hair scattered untidily around their pale faces now the poet goes on to describe four children who are sitting in the classroom in the slum the first one is the tall girl with her weighed down head there's a girl a tall girl sitting in the classroom with a weighed down head weighed down head means the child is sitting with the head bent she is not focusing on the lesson she is not interested in the lesson probably because the child is ill and she is exhausted then there is a paper seeming boy with rat eyes paper seeming boy the boy appears to be as thin as paper it's exaggeration but it refers to the fact that the boy is malnourished and he is terribly thin so paper seeming boy with rat eyes now rat eyes does not refer to the size of the eyes of the child nor the shape in no way are his eyes like that of the rat but what does it mean you find rats coming into your kitchens in search of food so when they are looking around what is reflected in the rat's eyes is hunger and here this thin boy is hungry and the hunger is reflected in his eyes so the poet has compared it to rat's eyes you know constantly on look out for food constantly hungry so the second boy seems to be hungry he is very thin 
there is also the third child sitting in the classroom now this child's growth is stunted what do we mean by stunted stunted means not achieving normal growth so the child probably is uh, not physically as developed as other children because he is malnourished in addition to that he is the unlucky heir of twisted bones he has inherited something from his father it's not a bank balance it's not wealth but this poor child has been unfortunate enough to inherit his father's disease what disease the disease of twisted bones so the child is misshapen he is sitting there in the classroom and he is reciting his lesson uh, from his desk now when the child is sitting in a corner and reciting the lesson to the poet it appears as if the child is not reciting the lesson but he is repeating his father's disease disease nald disease it's given disease of twisted bones means one and the same nald is twisted so the child sitting here in the classroom has inherited the disease of deformed bones twisted bones and he seems to be sitting and reciting a lesson but for the poet it appears as if he is repeating his father's disease there's one more child in the classroom at the back of the dim class one unnoted sweet and young the classroom is dim which which means that it's not a well ventilated classroom it's a dark and there is a child sitting right behind who is not noticed at all who goes unnoted who goes unnoticed he is a young child very sweet and his eyes live in a dream his eyes live in a dream it's not that his eyes are dreaming it means that the person is dreaming the child is also not focusing on the lesson the child is dreaming of what what is the child dreaming of he is dreaming of a squirrel's game in tree room other than this the child is dreaming of a squirrel's great game in a tree room other than this now what is the squirrel's game a squirrel runs up and down the tree it runs freely in its own surroundings and it's not restricted at all the squirrel seems to be you know enjoying itself running up and down the trees and here the boy dreams of being like a squirrel now there is a cultural context to this tree room in england children usually who had large backyards with trees in them they would normally have a tree house built for them by their parents so you can see what the tree house or tree house looks like so it's a place where the child enjoys you know inviting the child invites his friends over to the tree house the child may sit there all by himself read books he may play games with his friends he may run up and down the tree and that forms a very joyous part of his childhood life here it does not just mean that the boy is dreaming of a tree house like other children you know what other children possess a tree house of his own and running up and down the tree uh, you know going into the tree house and coming back it's not as just as simple as that here the most important point that you have got to focus is that the tree room is a symbol of the child's desire to liberate himself from his wretched world of slums he is dreaming of an open environment he is dreaming of achieving his dreams he is dreaming out the world out there and he does not want to be here which is reflected in the words other than this other than this place he wants to be somewhere else he wants to be outside he wants to see the world he wants to you know uh, achieve the dreams and goals that he aspires for so the tree house is symbolic of the dreams that the child wants to achieve besides the cultural background which i have already told you about now on sour cream walls donations now we go to the second stanza now 
In the second stanza, the poet has described the classroom in the slum. The first stanza was about the children sitting in the classroom in a slum. The second stanza is description of the classroom in a slum. Now I've put in some images here so that the idea is clear. You can relate because of the images that are put up here. On sour cream walls, donations. The classroom is painted pale yellow, the color of sour cream, you know, sour cream, pale yellow. And if you go deeper into the meaning, it's not just the color of the classroom. The word sour shows that the children probably are not happy here in this classroom. They are not happy sitting there. They are not happy, you know, uh, they are not able to learn what they actually aim to learn. And it is reflected through sour cream, sour cream. And people have come to the school, they have visited the school and they have uh, donated some things to the school which are displayed on the walls of the classroom. Now what are the donations which are displayed on the walls of the classroom? First, you get to see a picture of Shakespeare, you know, picture of Shakespeare. Now remember, Shakespeare symbolizes the highest that someone can achieve in terms of learning, you know. Next, there is a picture of blue skies without a single cloud in it. The third picture which is hanging on the wall shows civilized dome riding all cities. The fourth picture is of belled, flowery, Tyrolis valley and there is also a world map. So going back to the lines, Shakespeare's head, the picture of Shakespeare, it's put up there to motivate the students, you must achieve something in life, you must fulfill your dreams, you, you should achieve the highest that is possible in the field of knowledge prob probably, you know. So Shakespeare's head is representative of all that. And the blue skies, the picture with blue skies shows how beautiful this world is. And the third picture, civilized dome riding all cities. Now domes, you find the structures there on top of the uh, buildings, they have this dome shape. Dome, you know, since ages has always represented power and glory of civilization. The glory of civilization is reflected in dome-like structures and here it also goes on to show how in this civilized world there, is a, there are sections of people who live in not a manner which the rest of the civilized people live. They are deprived, they are marginalized. So civilized dome riding all cities. There is also a picture of Belled, flowery, Tyrolis Valley. Now, Tyrol is a province in Austria. It's a beautiful province. You understand when it is said flowery valley, valley filled with flowers, beautiful flowers. What do you mean by belled? Now, the churches had tall structures with bells installed in them. And they used to call the people to the church by tolling the bell. And this is what is meant by belled, flowery, tyrolis valley. You know? Then there was a map, the world map also displayed on the wall of the classroom. So, uh, yes, open-handed map awarding the world its world. Now, what do we mean by open-handed map awarding the world its world? Now, in the past, people never had an idea of the world that they lived in. Some thought it was flat, the others believed it was round, but today, because we have the world map, it's possible to visualize where the continents are, it's possible to understand where the oceans are located, and this world map gives us the idea of the world that we are living in today. We get an idea of how the world is, you know, geographically by looking at the world map. Hence, the poet says, open-handed map 
awarding the world its world. We get an idea of the world that we are living in by looking at a world map. That's what the poet means to say. So the children sitting in the classroom in the slum get to see all these beautiful things which are displayed in the form of pictures on the wall. But the reality is different for these children. And yet, for these children, these windows, not this map, their world. What is the world for the children of the slums? What do the children get to see when they look out of the windows of their own classroom? They get to see nothing but the dirty world of the slums itself. So, that beautiful world which is displayed in the form of pictures and which is hanging on the walls, framed, it has got nothing to do with the children's world. For the children, their world is the world of slums. So, for these children, uh, these windows, not this map, their world, where all their futures painted with a fog. Now, fog, mist-like condition. You'll find this is a pic which shows that, shows fog. Now, if you observe this picture, you see that you can see the trees up till here and after that you are not able to see the trees because they are all enveloped in fog. So what does it mean when the poet says their future is painted with the fog? If you cannot see clearly through a fog and if your future is like you know is enveloped by fog, it simply means that the children are unable to visualize their own future. The future is not clear. The future, they are not able to ascertain as to how it will be. A narrow street sealed in with a lead sky. Again, we find that the children who live in the slums, the sky is, it's given, they live in a narrow street, symbolizing the restricted space of the slums, the congestion of the slums, and it's given a narrow street sealed in with a lead sky. Now, a lead sky, lead, the color of lead is black or grayish, grayish black. And the skies are never gray always. You will not find the sky permanently gray. But for these children, the poet says, the, their lives are sealed by a lead sky, which symbolically means that the children's future is dark and it is uncertain. A dark sky. We find that the sun's rays are not shining through. Sun stands for hope. And here, the children live in a state of hopelessness. Their future is dark. So the poet has termed it as narrow street sealed in with a lead sky. Far, far from rivers. Now these children do not get to see the beauty of rivers flowing. They are away from the beauty of nature. Far, far from rivers. Capes. Now, what are capes? A cape is a narrow piece of land which is jutting out into a body of water. It is enveloped by water on two sides. It's beautiful. You know, capes are you know, uh, supposed to be part of the geography of uh, the topography of a place. And we find that uh, the capes add to the beauty of the landscape. So, capes are narrow pieces of land which are jutting out into a body of water, maybe a lake, maybe sea, maybe oceans, and they are surrounded by water on two sides, in contrast to the peninsula, which has water is, is surrounding it on three sides. So, they have never seen the beauty of capes, they have never seen the beauty of the rivers flowing, neither have these children known something which is given here as stars of words. Now, stars of words stand for knowledge. The children are deprived of knowledge, they are deprived of learning, you know, the higher forms of learning, and they are deprived of the beauty of nature. So, whatever may be the display, the pictures displayed on the walls, that is not the reality for the child who is sitting in the classroom in a slum. The reality for ch uh, the children in the slum is entirely different. So, what is the consequence of, you know, giving all these as donations to the school? What is the consequence of 
actually making the children understand the world is beautiful this is the heights these are the heights that you can actually reach so what the poet says is that surely shakespeare is wicked shakespeare is wicked shakespeare is not a wicked person he doesn't mean he is a bad person but why does the poet say shakespeare is wicked when you show the children this is what you can achieve in life and you don't provide them with the means of achieving it the children will be naturally disheartened and disappointed so someone who tempts the child with something and does not provide it to the child is definitely wicked you know because a child is innocent and a child you know if shown all these things would definitely like to you know be a part of it or even achieve what is projected on the walls of the classroom you know traveling to sunny lands obtaining uh, greater knowledge you know so here shakespeare is said to be wicked for this reason shakespeare is the symbol, shakespeare is a person who has achieved the highest that a person can achieve you know in the field of literature and the children who who actually look up to him as an example are do not have the means to achieve it the map is also a bad example the map shows sunny lands bright lands beautiful lands ships traveling to those sunny lands but are the children of the slum ever able to achieve their dreams of traveling to these sunny lands to these beautiful places on earth it's not possible for them the children love so many uh, you know so many things which they want to possess in life the children love to achieve their dreams your love ju just does not mean love in that you know just one sense of the term it can be love for knowledge it can be love for travel it can refer to you know so many different things which the child is unable to achieve because of the existing conditions and because uh, he is dwelling in a slum so what happens to children when they really hanker after these things what happens to children when their desire becomes uncontrollable the poet fears that it may push the children onto the wrong path it may make them steal in order to achieve their dreams these innocent children may turn into criminals because they have a desire but they do not have the means of achieving what they want in life so the reality for the children is that their lives for lives these children live in cramped holes and the poet has said for lives that slyly turn in their cramped holes you see a place in a slum a small hutment in a slum there will be so many people living in that cramped space it's like unto some uh, you know creature which lives in burrows and they they are huddled inside together where there is not even enough place for them to turn to roll and the cramped spaces in the slums are exactly like burrows or holes and these children have got to live in these conditions and the poet says the condition that these children live in is going to continue there is no respite there is nobody who can who is actually you know trying to save them here because he says this condition uh, continues and we can understand by the term fog to endless night now i already told you that fog shows uncertainty in life fog is some uh, is uh, reference to the future which is not clear and endless night what does endless night mean we experience night we we also go through day there is darkness there is sunshine but for these children the poet says the life their life moves on from fog to endless night so he wants to tell us that the there is absolutely no ray of hope in the lives of these children their future is dark their future is uncertain and they will continue to exist like this till the end of their lives so shakespeare is wicked the map is a bad example the ships and sun and love tempting the children to steal because they are unable to achieve their dreams and these children live in cramped spaces which are likened to holes where they do not have enough 
space you know for themselves and uh, their condition continues to be the same without undergoing any change and the poet says it's they they move on from fog to endless night they can never come out of it their future is dark their future is uncertain the future is uh, without any ray of hope on their slag heap these children wear skins peep through by bones and spectacles of steel with mended glass like bottle bits on stones on their slag heap i've just put up an image slag heap it refers to the filth and the dirt that exists in the slum slag heap these children wear skins peep through by bones if you happen to look at the image of this child who is so malnourished you will find that you know uh, the description itself it's a painful description where the poet says that the skin seems to be stretched over their bones the children are like skeletons mere skeletons you know and the skin seems to have been stretched across their bones they are pitifully thin okay so the skins they wear skins peep through by bones it doesn't mean that they are wearing skins it just refers to how thin these children have grown wherein you can find their ribs jutting out and they seem to appear like skeletons and we find that they are they uh, it is said that they have spectacles of steel with mended glass now students please understand this spectacles of steel has got nothing to do with the spectacles you know that someone wears now steel stands for toughness steel here refers to hard life tough life so spectacles of steel simply refers to the tough life that the children of the slums are le leading you know it refers to tough life spectacles of steel with mended glass what do you mean by mended glass now i can see clearly because the glasses you know they are intact suppose it breaks you know it is it has cracked up then i will not be able to have a clear vision you know when i see ahead i'll find it all fragmented now these children these children's you know life is tough and the vision of their future is fragmented it is not a clear vision you know so it is said that spectacles of steel with mended glass you cannot have you cannot you know understand what your future is going to how your future is going to shape up when you have a glass you know the spectacles with glass which is actually cracked so here the children are not able to visualize their future clearly like bottle bits on stones now what do you mean by like bottle bits on stones what's like bottle bits on stones you take a glass bottle and you smash it against a rock it will break into a thousand pieces now what has shattered here what is referred to as like bottle bits on stones the dreams of these children the dreams of these children have been shattered like bottle on stones like bottle bits on stones why because all of their time and space are foggy slum all of their time and space the children have been born in the slum they will live in the slums and probably will die in the slums okay so all of their time and space are foggy slum by now you know what foggy refers to so blot their maps with slums as big as doom blot their maps their maps the the kind of lives that they wanted to lead the map of their lives the map of their lives are blotted because they have been born and are living in the slums so it blots their maps with slums as big as doom now doom refers to death what does it mean over here the children who have plans for their future will never be able to realize their dreams will never be able to fulfill their goals and probably they are going to die in the in the slum itself without ever achieving what they dreamt of so on the slag heap 
in the dirty slums we find the children moving around who appear to be like skeletons with just some skin stretched over their bones they are pitifully thin they lead a tough life and they are unable to visualize their own future they have been they their dreams have been shattered like bottle bits on stones all of their time and space are foggy slum they have been born here they will live here and one day will die in the slums itself and the maps of their lives have been blotted by the lives in the slums they are life in the slums which will ensure that they will never achieve their dreams they will never be able to fulfill their goals and finally will die one day in the slums itself so we move on to the fourth stanza the poet says that the situation in the classroom in a slum changes only during three occasions when is it when the governor comes to visit the school when there is a school inspection and the inspector comes to visit the school or there is a visitor who wants to come to the school to see the progress of children or make some donation apart from these three occasions the the situation in the classroom in the slum remains the same this map becomes their window now this map refers to the map of the slums what they see outside the window is nothing but the slums this map becomes their window and these windows shut upon that shut upon their lives like catacombs you have to understand the concept of catacombs now what are catacombs catacombs are subterranean cemeteries which are uh, which were present you know uh, near rome subterranean underground now it was like you know it was a burial place the you find tombs inside these catacombs and a catacomb is a place wherein if you are if you happen to get lost you will suffocate to death there itself you will not be able to come out okay so what is the poet trying to say this map becomes the window the children are living in the slums their world is nothing but the world of slums what they get to see is nothing but the filthy slum and these windows will shut upon their lives like catacombs you know catacombs already the reference is given place of burial underground you know underground a place where uh, bodies were buried you know you find that similarly if these children are unable to get out of the slums now what is compared to catacombs here the slum itself so if the children are unable to get out of the slums and achieve their dreams and aspirations they will slowly suffocate to death in the slums itself they will live there they will die there and along with them all their dreams and aspirations will also you know die so the slum is like a catacomb and if the children are actually unable to come out of the slums it can spell doom for the children so the last lines of the poem they are very important very crucial the poet here speaks of the social responsibility what do people like us owe to the society what have we got to do for the marginalized section of the society what is our social responsibility towards the, uh, these children or such sections of society what's our duty we just cannot say that we are people who are privileged who are affluent and you know turn the other way spender speaks of social responsibilities and he says we you know he is addressing the readers and he is telling break oh break open till they break the town bring the children out of the slums get them out of the slums you know break oh break open just bring the children out of the slums and show the children to green fields take the children to green fields why should little innocent children grow up looking at the filthy slums why shouldn't children enjoy the beauty of the green fields symbolic of nature 
Why shouldn't you take the children to the beaches, make them run on golden sands, let them watch the azure waves lapping onto the beach? So let make their world run azure on gold sands. Take the children to the beaches. Let the children run on golden sands. Let the children enjoy the beauty of the waves, which, you know, dash against the shore. Let them see something beautiful. Let them see how beautiful the world is. Why should the children see just the dirty slums? Why should they lead a life like this? And this is not the kind of life which other children get to live. Why should it be that only these slum children are deprived of all joys of life? So he goes on to say, bring the children out of the slums, show them the beauty of the fields, let them also go to the beaches, let them feel the sands beneath their feet, let them run across golden sands and most important, let their tongues run naked into books. Now let their tongues run naked into books, it's an important metaphor. Tongues running naked into books just refers to the hunger for knowledge, you know, the hunger for knowledge. Tongues running naked into books give them higher opportunities of learning. Let them, you know, get knowledge as much as they wish to. Let them explore the world of knowledge, you know. The white and green leaves open. So white leaves stands for pages of a book and green leaves represents nature. So, in the previous stanza, he had already spoken about green fields and the beaches. So, connecting it, I say that the white leaves stands for book, which is symbolic of knowledge that one can attain and green leaves stands for nature. So, let the children have open access to knowledge and to the beauty of nature and now the poet says, if we do this, what's going to be the consequence? If we bring the children out of the slums, show them the beauty of green fields, you know, allow them to get as much knowledge as they wish to get, then history theirs. What will be history? What will be their past? Their lives in the slums will be their past and their future will be as bright as the sun itself. So history theirs, whose language is the sun? If we do this, the lives in the slums will be history, will be their past and their future will be as bright as the sun itself. Okay, students, I hope you have understood the poem. Let me quickly summarize the poem for you. In the first stanza, the poet says that the children's faces lack energy and enthusiasm. He compares the children in the slum to rootless weeds because like the rootless weeds, these children are unwanted, uncared for and unloved. The children who are sitting in the classroom, they have uh, hair scattered across their pale faces. The poet goes on to describe four children who are sitting in the class. There is a tall girl with a head bent, which shows that she is ill and exhausted. There is a very thin boy whose eyes reflect hunger like that of a rat. The third boy has been unlucky enough to inherit his father's disease of twisted bones. And at the back of the class, there is a young child who is very sweet who is not focusing on the lesson because the child dreams of a squirrel's game, child dreams of getting out of the slums and moving on in life and fulfilling his dreams and aspirations and living in a free beautiful world. So the child is not focusing on the lesson. We come to the second stanza of the poem, we find that the classroom in the slum is described by the poet, the visitors who have come to the slum, the classroom. Uh, to the school, they have uh, made a lot of donations which have been displayed on the walls of the classroom. Some of them are Shakespeare's head, uh, the picture of a sky, you know, uh, there's a picture of Shakespeare, there's a picture of blue skies, uh, cities with beautiful domes and a beautiful 
picture of Tyrolis Valley filled with flowers and bell towers. The classroom is painted pale yellow, which is reflected by the term sour, and it also reflects the mood of the children sitting in the classroom who definitely are not happy. And <coughs> despite, and there's also uh, the map which is displayed on the wall, the world map, and a world map actually awards us our world. It gives us an idea of the world that we live in. But for the children, these donations are meaningless because their world is the world of slums and when they look out of the window, they get to see the world of slums and this map has absolutely no meaning for the child. Their future is painted with the fog. The future of these children is uncertain and we find that it is dark without any ray of hope, you know, seeping in. These children are not aware of how beautiful this world is. They are far, far away from the beauty of flowing rivers, from the capes, you know, uh, which add to the beauty of a landscape and also from the opportunities of higher learning. Hence, Stephen Spender goes on to say that Shakespeare is definitely wicked. Why should Shakespeare's uh, picture be displayed on the wall when Shakespeare is supposed to be someone you've got to look up to and you have to strive to achieve what Shakespeare has achieved in life? The children definitely want to achieve what Shakespeare has achieved, but they don't have the means to achieve it. Similarly, the pictures of Tyrell Valley, you know, the picture of the skies without a single cloud in it, the pictures, uh, they all you know, actually tell a child, see the world is so beautiful, you can travel to these beautiful, bright, sunny lands, you can achieve whatever you want in life, you love so many, you know, things in life, you aspire to achieve so many things, you must try to achieve them, you must try to be there, you know, as what is, you know, projected, but they do not provide means to the child to achieve their dreams. So Shakespeare is wicked, and when a child desires to achieve and doesn't have the means to achieve, the poet says the child might probably, you know, uh, move on to a wrong path, end up stealing in order to fulfill his desires and dreams. So the children live in cramped holes, in tiny spaces and the future, their future is said to be dark and they don't seem to find, you know, uh, the brighter side of life, they don't seem to uh, find any ray of hope and the poet says their lives just move from fog, uncertainty to darkness. You know, so it's a kind of a vicious cycle, uncertainty to darkness, they cannot come out of it. And the slum is a very dirty place, you find the children moving around in the slums and they seem to be extremely thin and it's described as skin stretched over the bones and these children lead a tough life and they are unable to visualize their future and their dreams are shattered like bottle bits on stones. These children they have lived their entire life in the slums, they have been born here, they live here, one day they are going to die here and the map of their lives will be blotted by the life that they are leading in the slums without any escape and one day they will meet their certain death in slums itself. So in the fourth stanza, the poet goes on to say, say that the situation in the classroom in the slum changes only when the governor, inspector or visitor comes to the classroom in the slum. If not, then the reality is that the children are living in the slums, their world is the slums itself and their slums are compared to catacombs, underground cemeteries. You find that the children uh, will ultimately, you know, die in the slums without being able to come out. So the poet speaks of social responsibilities and he says it's our duty to help the weaker sections of society, the marginalized sections of society and he says this is our obligation towards the children of the slums. He says break or oh, break open till they break the town, bring the children out of the slums, show them the beauty of the green fields, you know green fields symbolizes nature. Take them to the beaches, let them run on golden sands, let them see the beauty of azure waves, the blue waves which, you know, come and dash against the shore. 
Let their tongues run naked into books. Let them get as much knowledge as they aspire to get. You know, let their hunger for knowledge be satiated. And the white and green leaves open. Let them enjoy the beauty of nature. Let them have access to knowledge. White, white leaves symbolizing books, green leaves symbolizing nature. And he says, if we do this, then history theirs. Their life in the slums will be their past, will be history. And what will be their future? Their future will be as bright as the sun itself. I hope this poem is very clear to you. And now let us move on to some important figures of speech in the poem. Far, far from gusty waves, we find the word far has been repeated twice, far, far. So the figure of speech is repetition. Like rootless weeds, it is simile because we find that the children are directly compared to rootless weeds. The paper seeming boy with rat's eyes is a metaphor because the comparison here is not direct but it is implied. Awarding the world its world, again we have the word world repeated twice. So the figure of speech is repetition. Where all their futures painted with the fog. Again, it's metaphor. Now implied comparison. What do you mean by implied? Metaphor is one of the main uh, figures of speech in this poem. By implied comparison, we mean that we can derive many meanings from this particular term. It's not fixed on to just, you know, like rootless weeds. If you take an example of children are compared to rootless weeds, they are like rootless weeds. It is fixed and definite. They are like weeds. But here, when we speak of fog, fog can, you know, generate multiple meanings for readers. So the comparison is implied here and hence it is metaphor. Similarly, a narrow street sealed in with a lead sky. Lead sky can refer to the, the color of the skies. It can refer to the, uh, uh, you know, the futile hopes. It can refer to darkness. It can refer to so many things. So hence it is metaphor. Surely Shakespeare's wicked, it's alliteration. Alliteration is where we have the repetition of the same sound or sounds. Surely Shakespeare, surely Shakespeare, you know. So we have the repetition of the same sound sure here, hence it is alliteration. From fog to endless night, it's a metaphor. Again, as I explained to you, fog and endless night, you know, we find that a fog can have multiple meanings. Endless night can also be hyperbole, exaggeration. Hyperbole is a figure of speech where uh, exaggeration is prominent. Night is never endless, but here it is given as endless night. So metaphor and hyperbole. Spectacles of steel with mended glass. Again, it's a metaphor where the uh, idea is derived, it's implied. Spectacles of steel with mended glass. Like bottle bits on stones, the figure of speech here is alliteration because we have the repetition of the same sound, b, bottle bits, bottle bits, hence it is alliteration. Slums as big as doom, now again there is exaggeration here, slums as big as death itself, it's exaggerated statement, hence it is hyperbole. And these windows that shut upon their lives like catacombs. It's very clear. These windows shut upon their lives like catacombs. You, you have uh, it, the comparison to catacombs here, you know, direct comparison. Hence, it is simile. Break or oh break uh, open. Now, break or oh break, when the poet is addressing someone, you know, it is apostrophe, break or oh break open, addressing you know, apostrophe, and it is also repetition. You can choose to write any one of these figures of speech if asked in the uh, exam. So break, break, we find the word is repeated twice, hence it is repetition. Make their tongues run naked into books, again metaphor, the image, you know, the implied comparison of tongues running naked into books, gaining knowledge satisfying hunger for knowledge, thirst for knowledge, you know, different meanings, metaphor. White and green leaves open, again it's implied. The idea is not, you know, directly expressed, but 
it is implied over here white white leaves i said white stands for the pages of a book green leaves stands for uh, nature you know so it is implied that's my conclusion another person may have some other meaning allocated to white and green leaves hence it is metaphor history theirs whose language is the sun now the language is the sun language is the sun is a metaphor a very important metaphor language is the sun what does it mean for you for you it can be the sun is bright for someone else it can uh, symbolize a ray of hope you know for somebody else it can symbolize that it's extremely hot the sun is shining hot shining bright and hot so here too the comparison is not direct but you can derive meanings from it it's implied hence it is metaphor so students i have uh, finished with the explanation of this beautiful poem written by stephen spender every word of this poem resonates resonates with meaning and uh, i have put up plenty of images so that if you have any doubt you can go back to the powerpoint presentation that i have made and you can understand the poem line by line okay thank you prudent scholars powered by lupin pharmaceuticals